Thank you for joining Marilyn Smith's webinar titled Sizing the Eventual Economic Damage of COVID-19, a Risk Assessment led by our own Dr. Clifford or Cliff Rossi. My name is Christine Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of Executive Education at the Smith School of Business, and we are working in partnership with the Smith School's Office of Alumni Relations to power this series. We would especially like to welcome our Smith and University of Maryland alumni and any current students who could have joined us today. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cliff Rossi. Cliff. All right, thanks Chris for that introduction. Um, you know, we've seen a lot uh, come out particularly after the sobering White House press conference last night about uh, COVID-19 and uh, it certainly is an unprecedented time for all of us here in the United States and, and the world alike. And, and we're just at the beginning of this event that undoubtedly is gonna have uh, just long lasting effects on society, trade, travel, and finance going forward. But before I actually begin my remarks today for, the, for our session, I'd like to actually make a few comments and observations about something that came out. If you happen to watch the press briefing over the last couple of days, um, it's important to kind of, uh, and quite relevant for us to kind of think about. In that meeting that from last night, Drs. Fauci and Burke showed several figures from models that were predicting mortality rates in the United States from the spread of the virus. Uh, left unmitigated, if you looked at that, uh, the numbers could reach well above 1.2 million uh, people or so, and with a full court press of mitigation strategies in place, would leave about 100,000 to 240,000 uh, dead in this country, pretty sobering numbers. But what failed to actually come out of that briefing was any sense that the models are actually quite fragile. And it's a stark reminder, and I'm reminded of this back during my time uh, in the 08 crisis, uh, that our models might feel at times uh, like they give us some sense of comfort that we understand the problem, we can look at these models and hang on their quantitative results as something that's tangible. Uh, but I would contend that they actually give us a false sense of security. We just, at this point, just simply do not know any more than we really have a good handle on the ultimate macroeconomic impact that this crisis will ultimately have uh, for us. Um, in fact, I've taken a closer look at those, at those models. I think there were several models, Harvard, uh, Columbia, uh, University of Washington, just to give you a sense of that. And, um, uh, you should point out that the standard diagnostics of performance and statistical goodness of fit that are associated with those models are basically non-existent. The data that's underlying those models are, as they said, from New York and New Jersey, so they don't necessarily represent uh, the rest of the United States. If, if, and I think basically what they're trying to do with those models is set us up for the absolute worst case uh, scenario. So in that sense, it's probably a good thing. Um, so in my mind, uh, these models do have some, some significant issues with them, but that's really not the focus of our topic. But since it was very topical from last night, I thought I would, would throw that in. So let me now turn attention to uh, the focus of our discussion today. Um, let me switch, first of all, to uh, sharing my slides for you. Um, if I can get that kind of popped up there real quick. Let me get this up. Sorry for that delay. And start it from... That slide. Get that going. Right, we there we go. Time. All right, thanks. A little technical difficulty, but we're good. Um, so in today's briefing, I really want to focus attention on where the financial cost of COVID-19 crisis may come in vis-a-vis -vis other financial crises, as well as kind of discuss how it compares to other major risk events that we've encountered in the past. Risk managers have a way of describing crises like COVID-19 and the financial crisis of 2008 in probabilistic terms that can provide a line of sight at least into where we think it may come up in terms of the overall economic cost. We describe those events that have extremely low probabilities of occurring, but when they do pose high severity of loss as tail risk events. And you may remember that back again during the 2008 event, people were talking about, oh, this is a tail risk event. So what exactly do we mean by the term tail risk? Well, we first have to step back and realize that we live in a world of just infinite different outcomes, economic outcomes, uh, COVID-19 outcomes, for example, each with their own gain or loss measured in whatever units we're interested in, dollars, quality of life, credit loss, whatever they might be. 
So to better describe this idea, imagine that we have a portfolio of investments, could be your own investments, that over any day will rise or fall in value, affected by economic and market movements. If we looked at enough of those daily observations on, let's say, a hypothetical portfolio, we would observe that on most days, we might wind up with a very small gain, and that on other days, we might have a very large loss or a very uh, large gain on the portfolio. So with enough daily observations, we can trace out a, a probability distribution of our portfolio so that the vast majority of the time, losses or gains stay within some measurable distance from the average outcome that we expect to see. And that measurable distance is our yardstick that we call standard deviation. We rely on that a lot in, in my profession. Economic scenarios will then drive where on that distribution an outcome will fall so that, for example, during the 2008 financial crisis, home prices declined in such a manner from peak to trough at the national level, it resulted in massive loan losses being observed during that time, if you recall. However, home price declines of that magnitude on a national scale were something that we hadn't seen since the Great Depression or about mm, roughly about a one in 85 year event or so. So now to frame this discussion, let's take a look at this next slide. It's a little busy, but let me kind of walk you through it. On it, I've depicted a distribution of economic gains and losses on the horizontal axis that are bell-shaped curve or so symmetric. That is, it has two tails. The leftmost showing the kind of more severe losses that we could experience, the rightmost, the, the, the highest losses that we could also experience on this distribution. We as risk managers are actually more interested in the worst tail of the distribution, so we're not really the life of anybody's parties. Uh, that is where very large losses occur on a, on a rare basis. Deciding exactly what cutoff exactly constitutes a rare event is somewhat of a, of a subjective choice, but most risk managers would place them at least at the 95th percentile worst loss, and most of us would probably even push it even further out. Events that lie above that percentile, that is down to the far left of this distribution, would actually be referred to as tail risk events. So I've put a couple of notable events on the figure to kind of give you some idea of what I'm talking about here. Note that both the 9-11 and the 1987 market crash events are also depicted as having generated relatively small economic losses and are positioned closer to the average outcome. Now, both, evident, both of these events, by the way, have been called out for comparisons to the COVID-19 crisis over the last few weeks from a financial impact perspective due to their large short-term effect and subsequent, you know, some people have been referring to this V-shaped recovery for the market and economy is perhaps one scenario that comes out of the present crisis. That is, with unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus, we could actually have this so-called V-shaped recovery that feels a little bit more like these, these other events. Now, I'll speak more to those specific scenarios a little later on, but let's take a closer look at the left-hand side of the distribution. What you see there is that I placed both the financial crisis of 2008 and the Great Depression in that tail risk area. The financial crisis is situated closer in to the more average side of this scale uh, than the Great Depression, which, for, which from an economic standpoint had severe economic effects for years after that crisis began, as we know. The way the two crises are positioned implies that the Great Depression was a much rarer event than the financial crisis, and it also resulted in a larger overall loss. So a key question being asked these days is where is COVID-19 going to fall on such a distribution? Will it be contained, that is, by the significant stimulus package that's been thrown at it so far? and maybe even more down the road, or is it gonna be more like a 2008 style financial crisis, or I uh, hope, hope it isn't the case, uh, even a Great Depression type of an event. But here's the thing, it's really kind of too premature for any of us to be prognosticating with any degree of reliability about the totality of COVID-19's impact uh, from an economic loss standpoint. At this point, all the macro models, not unlike the epidemiological models that I just mentioned, are wildly uncalibrated to an event like this, that we've just not seen these particular characteristics before in the historical record. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. But if the, if the macro forecasts of how this plays out are inaccurate, how could we start to at least think about factors that would ultimately drive impacts from COVID-19 from an economic standpoint and just kind of frame, frame it up? So looking at the next slide here, um, I attempt to lay this out, and it starts with having an understanding, first of all, of the major risks of previous events, as well as what drives economic loss outcomes for different crises. 
As many researchers have found, psychology and sentiment drive much of the behavior around financial panics and other crisis events. The running joke we've all heard, right, regarding stores running out of toilet paper is actually founded on principles of psychology explaining what drives fear and our reactions to it. Or the work by several Nobel Prize winning economists over the last decade or so, such as Dan Kahneman, who along with other of, their, of his colleagues was actually able to describe investment behavior in a way that ushered in the whole behavioral finance movement. Economic activity in large measure is driven by individual consumers and investors and market psychology and sentiment. And these become more accentuated in times of crisis like we're in today. So thinking back on the 2008 financial crisis that I certainly had a front row seat at, it was clear that significant behavioral shifts had occurred to greatly influence what ultimately came out of that crisis. Homeowners, for example, started looking at the dwelling not as a home so much anymore, but as a house or an investment vehicle, if you will, uh, rather than a consumption good. Investors, if you've seen the big short, for example, became more heavily levered in riskier assets such as subprime and non-traditional mortgage securities, all of which amplified losses in 2008 and beyond. Its behavior is affected by risk preferences whether that's someone that's risk averse or someone that's risk seeking, like I talked a little bit about on the Monday webinar, uh, such as around investment strategy. And beyond investment decisions, however, we find other risks that drive event loss outcomes. These include the risk of losing one's home, the mortgage default potential that we're starting to hear about in, in, in the news, or the risk of falling ill or dying from the disease, as is all apparent around us these days, or the risk of unemployment or the loss of business. Once we identify these risks, we can then move on to classifying what factors drive the magnitude of economic costs from a particular event or crisis. To keep things simple, I'm kind of laid out four. These include changes in economic activity or output decline as measured by GDP, duration of the event, impact on equity markets, and finally, unemployment impact. So looking at the table to the right of this slide that I'm showing you, we can frame some of these factors against the Great Depression and the 2008 financial crisis. As you can see, the Great Depression stands to be the clear benchmark of what we would totally call tail risk in terms of all four metrics when compared to an event that in our recent history was as devastating as it was, namely the 2008 financial crisis. As I mentioned earlier, both 9-11 and the 1987 market crash events were relatively short-term in nature and did not result in a recession. In my perspective, and I think in talking about the effects of the COVID-19 crisis, they're really not great benchmarks of comparison given the particular nature of, of the event that we're seeing today. So with all that discussion, as prelude to the main question of this discussion, you know, where do I think COVID-19 comes in in terms of a risk event? Well, before I kind of get to that, I, I, I think uh, um, it's directly related to a statement made recently by Dr. Uh, Fauci at one of the, the press briefings who said, the virus will set the timetable. Uh, that timetable is not only going to drive when the virus spread is contained, but also the duration and the extent of ac economic damage that we'll see. COVID-19 is unlike either the Great Depression or the 2008 financial crisis in my mind. It's actually, if I were to kind of liken it to anything, it'd be like an event that blends both the 1918 uh, flu epidemic with the 2018 financial crisis. And still, when I think about it, it's not exactly what we're up against. The reason is that where the Great Depression and uh, the 08 crisis were formed by a single risk event, namely the uh, emanating from financial markets, that is, the COVID-19 crisis was sparked first by a health crisis through which severe containment strategies has now brought the economy basically grinding to almost a halt. And as I said in the Monday webinar on this to uh, topic, the, the contagion risk brought about by the virus has now infected the rest of the financial system, creating other risks, market risk, credit risk, and liquidity risk, most notably. In fact, the degree of liquidity injection in the market by the Fed these days, as well as its remarkable monetary policy response, suggest that the liquidity risk, and again, in my opinion, is higher now than in 2008 and 8, notwithstanding the strong capital positions of commercial banks today from where they were back in 08. But other major market participants in search of liquidity, the small, medium businesses, the, even the larger uh, corporations on which the entire economy is buttressed against, pose a significant risk that required those extraordinary measures as we've seen, seen recently. Now, here's Another aspect of this, we're hearing that the crisis appears to be having spillover effects into the housing market, a major component after all of the overall economy. 
housing was coming out of the crisis, well insulated against another mortgage crisis, largely due to policy changes that came about on products from a, a credit standpoint and practices going forward to make those products and the industry safer than it was. However, the potential for significant defaults on mortgage and non-mortgage consumer debt are very real uh, apparent dangers today. Just today, actually, we see that mortgage applications fell 24% annually, and non-bank servicers, which account for the lion's share of all mortgage servicing today, which actually really changed and evolved since the crisis, where most of it had been in the hands of commercial banks, are going to likely need uh, a lifeline from the government to make it through because they are already balancing on a knife's edge in terms of liquidity and capital themselves. Not the banks, but the non-bank servicers. These servicers, by the way, are not very well regulated in the same way that the banks are and are much riskier institutions. I've done some, some actual empirical research of that. They're about two to three times riskier than, than, let's say, a commercial bank that's doing that same business. So we'll have to really keep an eye on that development. So given all that I know at this time about what COVID-19's effect has been so far on markets, and from what we've experienced in previous crises at this point, I think the crisis is going to play somewhere, unfortunately, between the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Depression. I know that's probably something we don't want to hear, uh, but we've already seen the worst unemployment report last week in decades come out, and that appears to be a precursor of other reports yet to come. In fact, you can see what's happened in Equity markets just responding yesterday to yesterday's news, and, and even this morning, the, at least by the time we, we started this, we had seen the, the actual numbers, but the futures market was not reacting very well. Equity markets have likewise fallen to levels nearing the 2008 crisis over this time, and while some recovery, a big recovery came last week, in fact, after the announcement of the big fiscal stimulus package, and that was quite heartening, it's likely that further significant market vol volatility is going to be in order for the foreseeable future. Other preliminary estimates of Q2 GDP put the COVID-19 uh, COVID event squarely in the 2008 financial crisis, Great Depression area, with some estimates calling for a 25% drop uh, in this quarter, in the second quarter for GDP. Again, where exactly the dust settles is dependent on the speed at which the spread of the virus becomes contained. Consumer, business, investment sentiment has significantly dropped off from the beginning of 2020, where it was pretty high and will continue to stay down until the virus is under control. The only hard data that we have to gauge duration of the event at this point largely comes from China and South Korea. And China's experience, as many observers have, note, have noted, actually provides an incomplete and faulty view of what could occur here due to a lack of reliable information coming out of there so far. That said, the experience does suggest that perhaps a one to two quarter duration to when containment is relaxed and recovery can begin. Now, looking at this kind of a bit higher level, uh, four wild cards, I'll call them, that will decide the duration of the health crisis and therefore the economic crisis are the following. Any reemergence of a so-called second wave of the virus, either later this summer or fall, the success of containment strategies that suppressing the virus transmission to other areas of the country, which could in turn extend the progression of the disease, the duration that is, the impact of the fiscal and monetary stimulus over the next six months on blunting the economic damage caused by reducing economic activity. And then finally, the deployment of therapeutic drugs that can severely arrest the virus's mortality rate. It's that latter effect uh, that I consider to be the true wild card and that I don't believe that market or consumer sentiment can really rally back before there is an effective treatment that can reliably diminish mortality rates to that that's more in line or has been more in line with typical influenza rates. Such an announcement will, in my opinion, signal the end of the COVID-19 crisis and the beginning of the post-crisis phase, which will include preparing for a potential seasonal effect going forward from COVID-19, which hopefully will be uh, a, a addressed with, uh, with a vaccine. So if I had to handicap the economic outcome based on what we know thus far, um, I, I'd say that COVID-19 is, is likely to look more like 2008 from a loss standpoint, assuming that the event, this is a big assumption, carries through the balance of the spring. In my opinion, we are already in a recession. I think several people were debating that fact even as, as uh, recently as a, a week or two ago, but I'm, I'm convinced that we, we are in one and we won't know until the data comes out, which is on a live basis. Uh, and I believe that recession could last well more than a year and could stretch well beyond that if it does look more like a 2008 stock crisis. 
The basis for this comment is that the scope of the economic impact is not only national, but it's also global, as it was back in 2008 as well. A purported economic snap back then, the so-called uh, hope for a V-shaped recovery is, is unlikely be, given the pervasive hit to sentiment and economic activity. That means I think we're in for a long haul out of this crisis, unfortunately, with long-lasting impacts on top of that for years to come. The stimulus package, uh, just kind of as an aside, accentuates an already pretty dire situation when you think about the country's debt burden, which uh, we seem to not like to talk about much these days. Uh, when looking at it from the standpoint of the debt to GDP ratio, for example, the additional stimulus that was already put on, the $2 trillion, will drive that ratio from about 107% to around 117 to 120%, depending on whether another round of stimulus will be required. And if you caught that press briefing yesterday, the administration had floated the idea of a phase four $2 trillion infrastructure stimulus plan on top of what we've already had. The World Bank, just to kind of give you a sense of this, the World Bank actually found that it, the countries with debt ratios over 77% of the long run tend to experience pretty significant slowdowns in economic growth. Um, that may actually wind up being one of the, the more unfortunate legacies of the COVID-19 crisis on top of the lives that are expected to be lost from this pandemic. So that really kind of concludes my remarks uh, at this point. Um, and so, I'd, Chris, I'd, I guess I'd turn it back over to you for any questions that you might have uh, on the topic. Yes, thanks, Cliff. And um, we moved so quickly that I didn't get to say thank you to you for your um, role at the Smith School as an executive residence and a professor of the practice. You've your, uh, okay. your, your your vast experience and your um, experience at different institutions and um, your teaching is is what makes us tick. So thank you for for uh, doing this and supporting supporting this work. Um, I do have a question, and folks, um, please you'll you'll see a note in the chat function that um, you can uh, post a question there, and we'll we'll present that to Dr. Rossi. Um, I have one for you though. In the meantime. Um, and okay. That. So the other day, Goldman Sachs projected that they estimate a plunge in GDP at the end of the second quarter of 34% and an unemployment rate of 15%. They say this would be followed by a 19% increase in GDP the following quarter. How does this square against your assessment of the COVID-19 economic damage lining up between the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Depression? Yeah, that, it's hard for me to sort of uh, counter uh, a, a Goldman Sachs analysis. They're 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 pretty good. Um, having said that, I, I, again, I I kind of lived this world back in '08. I mean, when we were bombarded almost every day, when, and I was a Citigroup at the time, uh, heading up their uh, their consumer lending group for North America. Um, it, and of course, all the mortgage assets. We were always being asked by. Um, uh, anybody who, outside investors and other people, where did we kind of peg where these losses would come in or, or where the, uh, the economy was actually going to wind up uh, being? And I can tell you that, you know, macro forecasts during a crisis like this or even at the beginning of one are very fluid. In fact, I think Goldman Sachs has, has actually uh, updated their forecast from the last time. Um, I think that I've heard those numbers before. And I, and I would just say, I'm, I'm probably one of those in the camp that doesn't believe that, that a V-shaped recovery um, will come back. And, and again, I come back to the fact that the engine of our economy has basically ground to a halt. Uh, restaurants are going to be out of business. Uh, many will. Um, that's going to be hard to get those back, even with the stimulus. Um, many small businesses in Main Street are going to be dramatically affected. I think you're going to see, and, and again, I'm not trying to paint a dire picture. I, I get no pleasure out of this, but I do think that we are in for something that we didn't have not seen even after 2008. So I'm not, I would not subscribe to the V-shaped recovery at all, particularly um, as you're seeing, you know, um, uh, significant pressure on unemployment and significant pressure on overall economic activity, not just here, uh, but also abroad. Thank you. One of the questions actually addressed the V shape is, is, you know, is there a different shape and what other factors might affect uh -huh. a particular, a particular implication shape that you see? Yeah. I, if I were to have to kind of uh, uh, 
you know, say what kind of a shape I think it could wind up being. I, I guess I'd be leaning more toward some sort of a um, um, a U uh, or an inverted kind of C, where we kind of we've slid down uh, sharply, uh, we kind of bounce around the bottom for some time, and then we start to sort of come back up. Um, quickly after some time uh that some time as i said where the how long we bounce around at the bottom instead of it being a v really depends on how uh the duration of the event as i said before those wild cards that i speak to uh how much the stimulus can actually um kind of give us that that that, that lifeline until we can get past it and whether this thing can even be kind of um, controlled by, by therapy drugs, I, I, I honestly believe that getting a therapy drug, and I know that's why they're all kind of focused on these um, and, and all these medical facilities, is because if you can um, take someone who otherwise is showing, and I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, nor do I play one on TV, but, but if you can get a drug that can take someone who is otherwise in the um, – the camp that would actually move into uh, needing um, ventil a ventilator, for, for example, and potentially progress to you know, a worse condition and per perhaps die, and you can arrest that, you can knock that out in a significant way and get those numbers back to more like a normal flu type of season event, then I think you see daylight. And, and that's kind of, that's, that's the wild card. And so that's why I think these macro models are going to be really struggling with kind of doing it because the macro models are dialed off of just that macroeconomic events. They're looking at unemployment rates. They're looking at other, you know, transportation activity and a lot of things that go into these, to, into these modeling frameworks. And so trying to then put in this dimension from, you know, from a virus standpoint is um, not a, not an easy task for anybody in the modeling community, either on the medical side or on the, on the economic side. Thank you. Not easy is what we're, what we're hearing from you. Um, you mentioned something about the debt earlier in your remarks. Um, someone asked about how the country's national debt um, might be combined with thinking about hyperinflation in the economy and, mm -hmm. and does that even have a, a different impact and would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of in the camp if I would worry about, about anything. I mean, I know the debt, the debt is looming out there, right? It's, it's something that, um, again, very few people other than those that are fixated on it on the economic side really kind of speak of. We just keep rolling along, so to speak. Um, uh, one of the things that we heard out of the last crisis, as long as, you know, the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry basket, you might be okay. And there are, unfortunately, in many other countries that lie above uh, the debt ratio that we have today. So um, I think hyperinflation is not something that I would be terribly worried about at this juncture, simply given the, the fact that economic activity has uh, basically cratered. And so uh, demand forces that would actually kind of uh, spur some more of that inflationary type of action, I don't, I don't really kind of see there in the foreseeable future. Um, if anything, you know, and I think the Fed is trying to kind of ward these kinds of things off, um, is, is any kind of evidence of a deflationary type of an impact. Uh, certainly, you've seen the Fed take uh, extraordinary measures over the course of the last few weeks to uh, dramatically drop interest rates to try to uh, reinvigorate economic uh, investment. But I, um, uh, that will wait to be seen how, how that works out. Thank you. Um, another larger um, perspective question. Do you uh, think the stimulus package that was just signed will be sufficient to blunt the crisis from deepening? You mentioned a fourth possible one. Yeah, no, I, 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 I should say, I don't believe that the uh, phases one, two, and three will be sufficient. And um, uh, I'm, basic, I'm basing that argument on the fact that if you think about uh, even if we were to, to take, let's take the, the, uh, the Goldman Sachs estimate about the impact of GDP into account. You're talking about roughly a 21, 22, I think, trillion dollar, uh, you know, output for this country on an annual basis or so. So if you've knocked out 
And I think while we're kind of are limping along at this point with, you know, the Amazons are still in business and Walmarts are still doing business in the stores and that kind of thing, the grocery stores and whatnot, uh, a huge segment of our, of our business has been taken out. And if you think about those numbers, $2 trillion is, you know, I'm not talking about the liquidity stimulus. Some people kind of confuse the numbers and say, well, it's really $6 trillion so far. And that's $4 trillion for the liquidity lifelines that, that the Fed has actually been kind of working on separate and apart from the fiscal stimulus, uh, which is the $2 trillion or so that, that uh, we've seen passed. Um, so I'm probably thinking there's going to be another $2, maybe $3 trillion um, yet to come. And, um, it's almost hard for me to say those words trillion, um, because the nature of the incremental impact that's piling on to the, to the debt that we have already is truly remarkable. Um, and it does underscore how significant this event is, uh, that the, that the federal government is, is, is quite terrified uh, that they need to get something underneath of the economy in order to keep it going during this period of time. So I'm um, I'm very concerned about that and do think that there'll be another uh, pretty sizable uh, stimulus package coming around. Not sure when, but uh, I would expect to see that. Great, thank you. Um, we have another participant question. Uh, can you please compare the benefits of the capital requirements versus the economic and structural impact of small and medium-sized businesses? Well, um, if, if, if uh, you're referring to capital requirements for banks, um, I'll just say, um, first of all, that banks are a whole different animal altogether than uh, the non finance corporations, right? So your Amazons of your world, your HPs, your, uh, your Carnival Cruise Lines, right? Uh, they're not holding capital, nor are they required to hold capital in the same way that a, that a federally regulated commercial bank or savings and loan or credit union would be. And so what we learned uh, coming out of the 2008 crisis was that uh, our financial services industry, our, our depository institutions, were not as well capitalized as they should have been to weather the storm that, that hit them. Nor was it the case either for uh, the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, uh, that they have sufficient capital, and of course they still sit in conservatorship to this day. Um, for other companies, uh, this notion of capital uh, in the same way that we think about it for, for, for banks is just a different, different idea or different concept altogether. And so um, they are, I'll go back to my uh, example that I like to use are mortgage servicers. Mortgage servicers, for example, are not uh, predominantly these days are non-banks, meaning they are not uh, required to hold uh, regulatory capital, risk-based capital as a commercial bank like a Wells Fargo or a Citigroup in, during my time who would have serviced uh, you know, millions of loans. Uh, these institutions, these non-bank mortgage servicers are not holding capital in the same way. And so when bad times come like they have, um, they can get taken out pretty easily. The same is true because they don't have a lot of li their liquidity. They're, they're dependent on, on Wall Street lines of credit, asset-backed commercial paper, short-term asset-backed commercial paper. If you go back to the days of another company that I work for, Countrywide Financial, um, they were, their lifeline for them during the crisis was $4 billion worth of uh, lines of credit out in the market that did not roll over. Uh, in fact, their counterparties, uh, creditors did not want to roll them over because they knew they were sitting out there with tons of subprime losses on their balance sheet. Moral of that story is we've got a lot of non-mortgage bank or a lot of non-bank mortgage servicers, that is, sitting out there that are in a similar situation where they are dependent upon lines of credit or these kinds of uh, these contingent lines, short-term lines in many cases, and that under circumstances like we're finding today, they're kind of living on that knife edge that I was speaking of. And that's why I think the federal government, Fed or, or other agencies are going to have to step in and do something to make sure that there is stability in that market. Great. Thank you. Um, here's more of a specific question. Not taking into account the models, uh, if you were sitting on a credit committee, would you ask, um, what would you ask of a company's management slash ownership in order to improve a line of 
credit or disbursement lend for payroll purposes, considering that as of today, there are no or almost no possible sustainable companies out there? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I, uh, there are many, many questions I would be asking. Uh, one of the first, and unfortunately, I would, I would have asked this question ahead of the crisis, and that's kind of like my, my mantra is you don't ask questions in the middle of the crisis of, of this nation. But I would have asked them, first of all, what are your, your liquidity uh, backup plans? What are your contingency plans for what kind of um, uh, backup lines of credit and other sources of liquidity can you have access to? You should just not be kind of going along, figuring, well, I've got uh, access to four different creditors when I need them, and they've been well, good to work with in a normal environment. Not during the normal environment, right? During a normal rainstorm when you need them. You need them during the monsoon, which we're in today. So I would have been asking, what are your backup plans? Um, and uh, what kind of stress tests have you performed on your liquidity positions to make sure that you have sufficient liquidity to kind of get you through a crisis like this? So most of the questions or the questions I'm just describing would have been something in advance. Now that you're in the crisis, um, it's going to be difficult for firms particularly those that are a little bit uh, shakier, as we found in 2008, uh, to actually go to the market and either, A, get access to roll those lines, or, e or B, to get them at, at reasonable uh, prices. Uh, you've already seen credit spreads, which are an indicator of what the market believes the likelihood of default would be on certain uh, of these entities, particularly as you get down to the uh, close to the, the bottom part of, of investment grade, you're seeing those spreads blow out. Not to the same level that we saw in 2008, which truly were astronomical, uh, but you've also seen some of the, uh, I don't know anybody out there on the, on uh, listening into this, you know, even, uh, even in, if you own a, um, an investment grade, a short-term investment grade bond fund, you will probably have noticed that it's taken some hits because those portfolio managers in order to kind of get a little bit more yield or juice in those, in those investment funds are, are throttling in some of the more marginal investment grade bonds, which have been taking uh, some hits in terms of credit spread. So that's uh, a long winded way of saying, I think uh, if you are in a crisis, a liquidity crisis, uh, going to be hard to dig out of one unless you do get a financial lifeline. We were, for example, back in 2008, right, the Fed came in and extended TALF. Uh, temporary asset uh, liquidity facility to, to banks in order to kind of make them uh, or allow them to get through. Thank you. The number of levers here are uh, is just amazing. We're going to end with one last question and um, ask you to get out your crystal crystal ball, as it were. Um, are there any specific wild cards in this crisis as you see it today to watch out for that will signal that the economy is at an inflection point to improve. A little positivity as we, as we close. A little positively, yes, as we kind of leave. I like that, leave on a high note. Right. Um, I would actually think, I'll, I'll just go back to my, to my comments and, and my prepared comments. Um, the thing that I think is going to be the defining moment is when we see an announcement made that a definitive therapeutic drug has been found to be um, very uh, strong at eradicating or at least suppressing the disease from further progression to more serious uh, illness. When we hear that has happened and that um, it has been proven to be the case, I believe that's going to be the signal that all clear, we can all come out, uh, live life as normal again, uh, the economy starts to get back on its feet because then we're able to say, we don't have to live in fear with this thing anymore. Right now we're living in fear because we just don't know, right? You hear stories coming out that, you know, that it's now distributed, you know, in the air. And then you hear other stories saying, well, that's not necessarily true. So until we can get hard evidence to eradicate that fear and emotion that comes with this, I think it's going to be, uh, 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 I think we have to wait and see. But I think there's hope. I will leave on that note. <laughs> a great note to leave on. Um, Cliff, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Absolutely. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for joining us. The webinar you've attended today has been recorded and will include the slides. We will let all attendees know where the, when the recording is available so that you can review and share with colleagues and friends. 
Please keep checking back with us for more webinars, short courses, and other learning opportunities from the Smith School of Business and Executive Education. Again, thank you very much from the Smith School's Executive Education and Alumni Relations groups and teams. We are here to support you in your lifelong learning. Please stay safe and go Terps. <laughs>